on this first Sabbath of the new year, it's a privilege to join you in worship here in the sanctuary. This won't be the most extraordinary sermon you've ever heard, but I guarantee you it has an extraordinary title. One word, an exclamation, aha! Let us in our imagination go back to the week of our Lord's serious passion, the scenes of the crucifixion. And we find these scenes brushed on the canvas of history in living colors. And these colors boldly exclaim the qualities of the participants in that scene. Red of anger, purple of rage, the green of envy, the yellow of cowardice, the gray of indecision, and thank God the blue of loyalty, the white of purity, and the gold of faith and love. Christ had prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he prayed, a torch-lit mob invaded the privacy of that moment, the wine-filled rabble of Israel coming to arrest the Creator and to take him off as a criminal. Oh, day of infamy. When they approached him, Jesus asked, Whom seek ye? And when they had responded, divinity flashed through humanity, and the record is they fell as dead men. You would have thought this enough to teach them a lesson. But Christ would not be delivered by divinity, not now. And so divinity passed away, as it were, and he again became Mary's boy, identifying with us in humanity. And he asked again, Whom seek ye? And this same group, having just recovered, stood up and said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Christ said, I am he. Send them away. Let these go. Jesus always like that. Facing danger, taking the brunt of things and letting us off. Take me, let Brooks go. Take me, let sinners go. After that he was abused and humiliated unspeakably. There was an excitement about sin that day, and the fair countenance of our Lord was soon covered with spittle. And then he was ushered before Pilate. The true king before the bar of an apparent ruler is the crowning paradox of history and the mystery of self-abasing love. Who can understand it? And Pilate looked at him as if to say, Thou a king? Poor peasant. He was incredulous. What a specimen to call yourself a king, said Pilate. But if you are a king, you should have a crown. And so a crown of thorns was brought to be pressed upon his head until the spikes ran along the cranium of his skull. A crown of thorns. Thorns represent the curse. You read that in Genesis 3.18. And I ask you, does not the thorn staring from the naked bough of winter in threatening ugliness or lurking beneath the flower and leaf of summer fitly represent the curse? When Jesus lifted the crown to his own head, he lifted the curse from the earth. Through him we need not live condemned. The curse is removed. Finally, one of the empire's 350-pound hardwood crosses is hauled out and dropped on his lacerated shoulders. The Son of God now is headed towards dead man's hill. His back had been laid open with a Roman rawhide whip, 
His clothes were sticking in his wounds. The fabric threads seem anchored in drying blood, as though taking root in the new furrows which the whip has left on his back. The gentle wind that rustles his garments, both torment and refresh him. Now, the cross was not a Jewish implement. Their penal ordinances did not require the cross. The cross came from the Carthaginians through the Romans. There was nothing quite like the cross. It consisted of an upright beam with a slanted block at the bottom so as to offer no support to the victim's body. And across the top, an horizontal beam where a man's arms were first stretched and then fastened. His legs were bent in an unnatural position, affecting circulation and inducing numbness and asphyxiation. You see, on the cross, suffering was supreme. Killing meant very little. Killing was anticlimactic. All it meant was the show is over and the crowd can go home. People came not to see men die, but to watch them suffer. And they were fastened on the cross to do just that. The nails were set so as to avoid vital arteries, so that a man would not bleed to death quickly. And a criminal paid according to his crime. It is said that a healthy man could spend four days and nights on a cross. And if he stayed there long enough, all the things concomitant with dying took place in the presence of an audience curious and morbid. A man's tongue would swell in his mouth, and if his head fell forward instead of backward, he could choke to death on his own tongue. And the sounds from the crosses were grisly sounds of labored breathing. Jim Bishop graphically pictures the well-made, well-cared-for, sun-tanned, muscular body of Jesus on the cross, hanging there by the weight of his body against the nails until the excruciating pain in his hands reached a crescendo of agony and screamed for relief, and then he pushed up from the slanted block to relieve the agony in his hands, only to feel it in his feet, and he would stay there until his feet could bear it no longer, and then he would sag again, up and down, up and down in spasms of unspeakable torment. In addition to that, the vultures circled high and then low. Vultures and ravens would take a meal while life still resided in the wretched and fevered tenement of the flesh. The insects would feast before the breath had fled. The cross is not pretty as we think about it. Above the head of Jesus, Pilate ordered... A jarring sarcasm aimed at humiliating the Jews. He nailed this board against the protestations of the Jews with this superscription, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And all the evangelists tell us it was written in three languages. First of all, in Hebrew, the language of the patriarchs, representing the language of religion. And secondly... It was printed in Greek, Greek, the language of culture, the golden tongue which gave a soul to the objects of sense and body to the abstractions of philosophy. And after that, it was written in Latin, the dialect of those originally the strongest of the sons of men. These three, expressing revelation and art and literature and progress and war and jurisprudence. In every language then known, Jesus was called king. Hebrew, the language of religion. Greek, the language of culture. Latin, the language of power. Let's go back through these and consider now, what is the message from the cross 
for those who are men of culture. It is the same message of Pilate's joke. It is the message that Christ must be king in intellectual circles, in academic communities. Christ must be king in the classroom, in the med school. Wherever men aspire to intellectual greatness, Christ must be king, or else they, as Ellen White says, are but polished instruments of the devil. What is the message from the cross? To those in positions of power, it is that Christ must be king, and that he must bring with him into the hearts and into the circles of power the divine standards of heaven. Christ must be king amongst men of position, men in the White House, men in the Senate, men in the House of Representatives. Christ must be king in the Supreme Court. He must be king in the boardroom. When the committee meets on the bench in local assemblies, wherever men exercise power over other men, Christ must be king. Or this power will be prostituted and men will be oppressed. And finally, what is the message of the cross to those in religion? Hebrew. If Christ is not king here, then all of our gathering together for worship and all of our praying and testifying is but sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. It is not only nothing, it is worse than nothing, for it is the perpetration of fraud. Christ must be king amongst the religious. On the cross, Pilate's joke became an awesome prophecy and a terrible reality. A king, though crowned with thorns, a king, though the cross is his throne, though rusty nails are his scepter and mace, he is a king. He ruled as he died. He reigned while asleep. The sufferer is author and finisher of our faith. Pilate's white board long since perished, crumbled and returned to dust. Yet there is a glorious sense in which that inscription can never be obliterated. Christ is king. It said on that board, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Let's look at it again. Jesus, blessed name, Emmanuel, God with us. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. That's what God is like. How can you think of Jesus as being merciful and think of God as being austere? He came to reveal the Father, Jesus, God with us, blessed and holy name, Jesus, Jehovah, unspeakable gift. And then it said Jesus of Nazareth, indicating his great condescension. Few towns were as notorious for rascality as Nazareth. As a matter of fact, Nazareth was such an awful town, one of the disciples who had not yet gotten acquainted with Jesus asked, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? The Spirit of Prophecy says God chose Nazareth as a place in which his son should grow up. So many of us blame our weaknesses on our location, on the atmosphere around us, on our neighborhoods. Some of us say that if we could move into a better community, we could be better Christians. That's hogwash. It is simply not the truth. Noah was perfect in his generation. The Bible says so. In the midst of a perverse people, he was perfect. The problem is not location, it's nature. It's not what happens around us. It's what happens in us that makes the difference, you see. Jesus of Nazareth. God chose a place where his son could grow up rubbing shoulders with profligates. He heard the awful music pouring out of the windows of his village. He heard the profanity and the cursing from the taverns. Jesus grew up in a rotten place, but so pure that one of the appellations by which he is known is Lily of the Valley. As the lily grows up in the muck and the mire of the swamp and unfolds its petals so pure. 
Jesus of Nazareth, King. King he is called, and King he was, he is, and he shall be. And the day of his coronation is yet in the future, and at that time the Scriptures declare that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And then finally, King of the Jews, and this refers to his future glory. In order to understand that, we must go back to the Apostle Paul, who declared he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and the circumcision is that of the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart. Paul said, Further, if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. When we become Christians, therefore, we become spiritual Jews. Now, this will not change the color of your skin or the texture of your hair, but I tell you, it'll change your heart. King of the Jews, king of the redeemed, king of those who have enough faith to trust in him and accept his authority in their lives. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, and one day to be crowned the king of kings and lord of lords. And ladies and gentlemen, Golgotha. The place of the skull where men went to die, they now go to live. And there we see him hanging in our mind's eyes. A small group of women who attended him are the only ones to offer him solace. The men folk have fled. Only John stands on the periphery of the crowd, drawn by love and repulsed by fear. The women are there. Jesus made woman in the beginning to be an help meet for man, a consolation to him. And they've gone from Adam's rib to women's lib. But women's lib notwithstanding, God's way is the best way. And I want to say to the ladies here, you owe Christ something, for only in Christian places are women elevated to the pedestal of ladyhood. And I want to tell you something else. There is no risk to your person, your individuality, or anything else when you submit yourselves to your own husbands, if those husbands love their wives as their own flesh, which the Bible commands them to do. There is no threat to you when your husband loves you that way. So the Lord's way is the best way. Woman was made to be a comfort to man. And, of course, man was to reciprocate. And now as the Son of Man hangs on the cross, he does not refuse the attention of these holy women who have come into his presence to offer comfort. Mary is there, the mother of life, and with her is Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. And then there is Mary, the wife of Cleophas and Salome, each the mother of two apostles. They are there. And they're there in the midst of an angry and hostile crowd. A crowd whipped into a frenzy of hysteria by the priests and the Pharisees. And there is something to say here about following a crowd. Humanity is afflicted with a herd instinct. Crowds don't make decisions. Crowds don't even think. Crowds are led and manipulated and used and thus abused. And there was the crowd whipped into hysteria, and these faithful women in their midst, and in that crowd a type of every one of us. The priests were there, the Pharisees were there. They incited the crowd, according to Desire of Ages. In that crowd were shopkeepers and grocers. They had something against Jesus, for he had fed the 5,000 with a little boy's lunch, cutting in on their trade. In that crowd were doctors who were turned off by him. Because he healed people for free and did damage to their lucrative business of blood-sucking and extortion. And in that crowd were funeral directors who had to give refunds on funerals because when Jesus met one, he brought the dead to life and sent the caskets back and dismissed the mourners. In that crowd, someone like you and someone like me, and then two thieves. Jesus was dying between unbelief and belief. And now we come to verse 29 of Mark 15, where we find this expression that is my title today. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha! 
If you read the authorized version, it simply says, ha. What in the world? First of all, let me point out that the context seemed to suggest that it was not their real problem. They were just passing by and were influenced by the sentiments of the crowd. This word, aha, is an exclamation of scorn and contempt. Aha is a derisive cry. It is a cry of mockery. And ignorant men and women who had not known the Lord beheld him suffering and were unmoved, having never known the mystery of compassion and grace. Instead of feeling sorry for him, these non-thinkers, these worldly souls who simply went along with what others were doing, cried, Aha! and cast their arrows of bitterness towards the heart of the Lord. They saw Jesus hanging there, and they knew he was helpless. As a man, it was all over except the shouting, and they shouted a head-wagging jeer, aha! And ladies and gentlemen, if the final balance had been taken at sunset that day, they would have been right. The church calls that day Good Friday, but it was not good. To the disciples, it was the worst Friday that had ever dawned. It was bad Friday. Peter didn't recognize it as good. He had cursed and sworn. His soul was barren. His heaving breast exploded in grief. It was a dark Friday for Peter. The others had fled also into darkness. But you know, it wasn't finished on Friday. Friday was the devil's day. A modern evangelist has proposed an allegory that I cannot resist. He said that death and hell had a meeting that day. And death said to hell, If I claim him and deliver him to you, will you hold him? And hell from Hades the grave replied, If you deliver him, I'll hold him. And so they made a covenant. Death hounded the Lord until finally his heart burst in his breast. He dropped his head in the hollow of his shoulder, screamed in passion, and yielded up the ghost. And then death said to hell, Now, hell, I've done my part. You take him, and you do your part. You hold him. And according to this man's allegory, hell cried out, Get these women out of here. Seal my bowels with Roman mortar. Set a guard of Roman soldiers at the gate, and I'll hold him. And if I keep him for four days, his body shall see corruption, and I've got him forever. So Good Friday closed with a ha. But you know, God's acts cannot be measured in a short time frame. Like election day, all the returns are not in at sunset. God was not finished. And so a day passes, and death is a little anxious. And death visits the garden and says, Hell, have you still got him? And hell replied, I've got him. They didn't know that Jesus was just keeping the Sabbath, resting in the tomb. And then two days, or Saturday night, and death came by and said, What about it, hell? Hell said, I've still got him. He hasn't moved. The Roman soldiers are still on duty outside. Everything is okay. Aha! The sneering taunt of the bystanders was premature. For the third day came, and death was getting very anxious. Death cried into the gray, murky darkness of the coming dawn, Hell, have you still got him? And hell responded, Well, death, you see, it was like this. There was a blinding light from glory, and an angel rolled the stone away. And I couldn't hold him. He got up and walked out. And as if that were not enough, he insulted us both, for he looked back with mighty and holy scorn and said, O death, where is thy stay? O grave, where is thy victory? And so the silence of Sunday morning was not broken by the hawkers and vendors, nor the rabble of Israel finally read of their nemesis. 
It was broken rather by pounding foot leather as Roman soldiers ran hysterically past the Antonian Tower, crying to the sleeping city, He's alive! He's alive! That cry struck with the suddenness of thunder and death and jerked the high priest up from his slumber. He's alive, was the cry. And the crowd that on Friday evening had shouted, Aha! Now says, Huh? What are we talking about? I think it's important for us to remember that the flood tide always follows the ebb tide. We may do as we please with contempt and scorn. But there is a day for settling the score. There is a day of judgment. There is a day to be reckoned with, a day to give account. And we are close to that day. God is trying to wake us up in every conceivable way. We are living in an age of national and international perplexity. God is trying to speak to us, showing us the uncertainty of man and the insecurity of man's affairs. But what do we say to God? Aha! Contempt for his word. Bold to ignore him, as though we were indeed masters of our own souls. Morals are cast to the ground. Great truths are on the cross again. We live in an age when it's smart to be filthy. It's chick to utter profanities. To be lurid and lewd and filthy in our speech. The Bible said this day would immediately precede the day of the Lord. And Christ is showing us by these signs that we are near the end of time. What do we do? Aha! Contempt for what he has to say. Drugs have turned young people into the streets and produced streets full of immoral nitwits. So that we live in a time of constant peril. It's dangerous even to walk out of your door, night or day. God is trying to tell us something. But what do we say to him? (laughs) Mysterious anomalies haunt the soul. Last year, the church of Satan turned down 5,000 applications to the priesthood. And the Roman church ran 5,000 short. God's trying to tell us something. Eastern mysticism is invading Western culture and is attaching itself to popular things and to violence with Kung Fu and Karate and etc. Goes the philosophy of meditating until you're faster and stronger and swifter than anyone else. Movies dwell on forbidden themes. The lowest blasphemies are unraveled on the silver screen in films such as The Exorcist and Godspell. And churches stand up and approve and have thus become, in fulfillment of prophecy in many cases, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird and the hold of every foul spirit. There's a judgment going on, ladies and gentlemen, and God is speaking to society for a final time. The scriptures cannot be broken, and prophecy has spoken clearly. The things that show his coming near are fast fulfilling year by year. It is almost impossible to discover a prophecy that is not now being fulfilled. The last one or two have to do directly with the actual appearance of our Lord and those things which transpire along with that great event. Are we asleep or awake? How do we feel when God speaks to us so directly? When he steps on our toes, so to speak, in an attempt to get our attention and turn us around. Aha! He must be born again. Ah! Young man, give me thine heart, not me. He goes on to say, keep thyself unspotted from the world. A Christian cannot indulge everything his flesh desires and be ready for the coming of the Lord. But we will go to our movies. We will drink our cocktails. We will listen to our music. We will wear whatever clothing we desire to wear. Aha! We are saying to God, whose counsels are best and good, and whose counsels alone produce happiness here and in the life to come. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Aha! I'll marry whom I choose, and I'll associate with whom I choose. This contempt for God, as though he were just another man. 
Indeed, society today deems him less than another man, someone to be ignored. The butt of blasphemous jokes. Aha! But the day comes when God's church will be thrust into prominence, not through the excellent services of our PR department, but through persecutions and trials which the Bible says will come as God throws his people into the crucible of fire that the gold might be refined and the dross consumed. It's coming because the Bible says so. Like it or not, it comes, for the word of Scripture cannot be broken. And this shall be followed by God's voice thundering from heaven, It is done. It is done. The spirit of prophecy tries to give us some graphic portrayal of the terrible upheaval and commotion at that time. I read these words. Foundations of the earth will shake. Buildings will totter and fall with a terrible crash. The sea boils like a pot. And the whole earth is in terrible commotion. The Bible says mountains will be moved out of their places. And men will scream in terror. The proud, the recalcitrant, those who stood up against God and would not listen. The day will come when they will want to listen, but it will come too late for them. For the Bible says the decree will go forth, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Whatever you determine to be, go ahead and be it. For probation will have closed. The doors of mercy will have swung shut on the hinges of grace, and there will be no further opportunity for repentance or for prayer. It is done. And the end shall come. And the proud, and the haughty, and the rebellious, and those who wouldn't listen, are going to be sorry. It's no kick to be lost. It is ultimately and inevitab inevitably not smart to ignore God. It is stupid. It is foolish. It is the height of folly. Today is the time to pray. I have an extraordinary book in my library. It's called The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. The scholar who wrote that book ravaged the pages of history, looking not for the great achievements and triumphs of men, but looking for the closing, the descriptions of the closing moments of great men's lives. And he has recorded these. In that book, the final known words of Dwight Eisenhower, former president of this country. According to that book, Mr. Eisenhower asked Billy Graham, how does a man know when he's ready to meet God? And after hearing the explanation, Dwight Eisenhower said, thank you, I am ready. If those indeed were his last words, how noble, how wonderful. But I was looking for something else in my study of that book. I wanted to find out what the big shots had to say who thrust their puny fists in the face of God and who laughed in his face. I wanted to see what they had to say. So I looked up men like Voltaire, the great philosopher who said that in 50 years the Bible would be an exploded book. Nobody would read it. It would be laughingstock. Well, he's been dead longer than that. Many of you never heard of him. But the Bible is still the world's bestseller. When Voltaire died, he died according to this book, looking about his room as though assaulted by a thousand demons afraid, his eyes walled in fear. And he said, I am damned. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Nearly all of his life he had said, aha, to the word of God. But now, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Next year is our bicentennial year. And one of the great patriots of America was Thomas Paine, who wrote The Age of Reason. I went to New Rochelle, New York, and visited his home. I went into the room where it is said he wrote that blasphemous book, urging thinkers not to accept anything by faith, particularly the word of God, but to believe only that which is rational and logical and which can be proved and which has been tested scientifically. But when he came down to die, the noble patriot Thomas Paine cried out, I would give a million worlds if I had them, if the age of reason had never been written. Don't leave me. God have mercy upon me. I am a lost man. Lord have mercy upon me. In his book, oh, ha, when he died, Lord have mercy upon me. This is a brand new year with new challenges, new problems, 
new trials, new vicissitudes, but new opportunities, new grace. How will we face it? Will we listen to God while there is time? Or wait until it's too late and join the crowd in a prayer meeting praying to rocks and mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of God? What shall it be? Not in big things only, but in small things. When God speaks, what will it be? Aha! Uh-huh. Or oh, I accept, Lord. I want you to think about that as we begin this new year. Let us pray. We thank Thee, our Father, that Thou hast spared our lives through 1974. And we are brought to a new year, this month January, named for the mythological god Janus, the god of two faces, one looking forward, one looking backward. And as we look back, great is thy faithfulness. But as we look ahead, the future is unknown. We pray that thou wouldst arrest us. And while you have our attention, speak to our hearts and speak peace. Give us wisdom that is from above. Help us, we pray, to submit to divine authority. Help us, we pray, to accept your providences to line up on your side. For soon the heavens shall split wide open and Christ shall be seen riding down through space in chariots of flaming fire. The earth shall be thrown into convulsions. An earthquake such as never was, the Bible says, will take place. Islands of the sea will be swallowed up. Mountains will move out of their places. The great masses will flee from thy presence because they have never known thee. They've never submitted to thy love or received thy pardoning grace. But Lord, there's going to be a group there present at that time that shall not be afraid. They will realize that the age of eternal relief has come. They will look up and hail thee with joy. In the name of Jesus, grant that we will be in that number. And now let thy peace be upon us. And as we go into this new year, by thy grace, may we go with God. 